Hey, and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment to say hi in the chat and let us know that you are here.
Hey, and welcome to River City Online. We're excited to have you join us today. As we get started, please take a moment to say hi in the chat and let us know that you are here. We anticipate that we will experience God's presence today as we worship together. So feel free to connect with your host anytime and ask for prayer. We hope you have a great day.
River City Church online community it is such an honor to be with you today. Uh, my name is Nathan Breithop. I actually grew up in River City Church. For those of you who don't know me, uh, spent my whole life on, uh, at River City and, and later on my wife and I were sent from River City to pastor in Walla Walla, Washington. So I'm just super excited to share God's Word with you and uh, and to, to get to know each other here uh, as we experience God's Word. All right, now that I've introduced myself, can I ask a very personal, probing question? How's your soul? 
you know, in the grocery store, you walk up to somebody, hey, how are you? And we know the rule of thumb is we just say fine, but I, I'm asking a deeper question than just, hey, how are you? I, I want to know, how's your soul? And by that, I mean, how's your mind? How's your will? How's your heart? How's your emotions? Uh, John wrote in 3 John 2.2, 2, he said this, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. So this is a very important question. How's your soul? And this scripture seems to imply that health happiness, the quality of your life, these things are all connected to the condition of your soul. He says, as it goes well with your soul. So today we're going to have a checkup on our souls. You didn't know it would be a pop quiz today. A checkup on your soul. Um, God actually commands us in his word to keep track of our heart, to keep track of our soul. Proverbs 4 23 says, keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Keep your heart with all vigilance. How important is it to, to know the condition of your soul, of your heart? So I want to ask you again today, how's, how's your soul? How's your heart? Are you still dreaming with God? Do you still have passion is prayer, meditation, intimacy with God more difficult than normal, or is it a joy? How are your emotions? Maybe I should ask your spouse this one. How are your emotions? This often reveals itself in those close relationships. Are you more angry than normal, more impatient, more sensitive and insecure? Are you experiencing fear and despair and insecurity? How's your mind? What consumes your thought life? Are you filled with hopelessness and doubt or faith and hope and vision? You see, I, I recently learned this. It's impossible to be spiritually mature without being emotionally healthy. If I could say it another way, you, you can't have a healthy spirit without having a healthy soul. Or even maybe another way of saying it is this, your outside life can't be bigger than your inside life. Throughout church tradition, there's been this, this term, the dark night of the soul. And it's pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's a, a spiritual crisis in our journey towards union with God. And we all spend seasons in the dark night of the soul. And when you read the, the story of Scripture, we see God's people are constantly being uh, sent or finding themselves out in the wilderness. Even Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. We all spend seasons in the wilderness. We all experience the dark night of the soul. Let me read you something from a, a, a journal, from a, a, a godly person, um, and let me just give you a window into what this person was experiencing. Listen to this from, from this person's journal. Depression surrounds me on all sides. I can't lift my soul to God. No light or inspiration enters my soul. Heaven, what emptiness. Not a single thought of heaven enters my mind, for there is no hope. The place of God in my soul is blank. You want to know whose journal this was? This was Mother Teresa. This is Mother Teresa's experience of the dark night of the soul. And I have to tell you, if Mother Teresa experienced a wilderness season, if, if Mother Teresa felt this dark night of the soul, then you and I can expect to go through those seasons too. So the question isn't whether or not we will experience those seasons. The question is, how will we handle those seasons? So how do we navigate the dark night of the soul? Well, one, you can't wear any masks. There is no pretending. If you want to make it out of the wilderness season, still standing with Jesus, if you want to make it out healthy and happy and better than you were when you went in, 
no masks, no pretending. Let's be honest with one another. Let's be vulnerable and trust one another with the condition of our soul. How about I teach you some Latin today? Cicero, Roman philosopher, he coined this phrase, esse quam videri. I can't roll my R, so esse quam videri. I don't know. Esse quam videri. And this is what it means. It means to be rather than to seem. To be rather than to seem. You see, in observing human relationships, he, he noticed something in, in his friendships. People were more willing to withhold their true condition and seem a certain way rather than just being who they were and where they were in life. See, most people would rather seem like they're okay than be who they really are. So today, I'm asking you, can we be rather than seem? As God's people, we should be rather than seem. Jesus tells a beautiful parable that I think illustrates uh, this point so well in Matthew 25. It's Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Um, let's read this together. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Hey, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. All right, let me share some observations from this parable. First of all, they're all virgins. They all look the same on the outside. They're all virgins. They, vir, uh, when, when Jesus uses a virgin here, he's, he's speaking to purity. So this isn't like the sheep and the goats or the wheat and the tares where we have believers and unbelievers mixed together and we're trying to figure out which ones are believers and which ones are unbelievers. This isn't that parable. These are 10 virgins. They're, they're all believers. They're all pure. Um, they all have lamps. So um, these aren't baby Christians because lamps represent good works or ministry. Remember, Jesus tells us not to hide our lamp under a bushel. So these are Jesus followers who know their Bible and they pray and they serve in the church. But the truth is their outside life doesn't match what's going on on the inside. Half of them have no oil. They have no passion. There's no fuel behind their religious activity. The inside doesn't match the outside. And I think here the tr strangest thing in the story is this point right here. They all trim their lamps. Half of them know they don't have oil. Half of them did not bring oil with them. When you pick up an empty lamp, don't you think you could feel like it's me in the middle of the night when I want to drink some milk straight out of the jug, right? I go into the kitchen, my eyes half closed, you pick up the carton and you go, oh, too light. It's empty, right? So they pick up their lamp. They know there's no oil in this lamp, but what do they do? They trim it anyway. Why? Because they'd rather seem like they're spiritual than be who they really are. Admit that they're empty, that they're dry, that they need more oil. Dead religious activity. Try to fit in. Try to appear healthy. Pray harder. Serve more. Read my Bible more. But there's no oil. 
And then they try to borrow some oil. And, and by the way, the lesson here, when, when they ask to borrow some oil and, and the other half say, no, get your own oil, Jesus isn't giving us permission in this story to just be selfish Christians. That's not the point he's making here. He's saying oil can't be borrowed. You have to go buy your own oil oil. You can't borrow oil. You have to go get it for yourself. You can't coast off of someone else's passion. You can't ride someone else's coattails. You've got to go buy oil for yourself. And the dark night of the soul is the place where we all get to find out whether or not there's oil in our lamps. Oil matters. We can see this at the end of the story. Oil matters. But yet how much of our Christian activity is simply polishing the lamp? We worry so much about what's going on on the outside. As a pastor, I want to show people all the amazing ministries we have in our church. I'm so proud of our children's ministry. I'm so proud of our outreach. I'm so proud of our worship. I'm so proud of our preaching. Look at my beautiful polished lamp. But the question is, is there oil in that lamp? Because the only thing that makes this thing a useful lamp is oil. A lamp without oil, just just put it on a shelf. It's just a decoration. It has no use. Oil matters. You can fill your schedule with busy work. You can try really hard to grow yourself and and polish yourself and make yourself look spiritual by, by volunteering for everything and joining every group available and, 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 and trying to look and act like a mature Christian. But the truth is, if you don't have oil, you won't make it through the dark night. Oil is the cure for the dark night of the soul. So, this begs the question, where do we go to get oil? Where do we go to find this healing oil for the dark night of the soul? We go to Jesus. We go to Jesus. Did you know... um, Gethsemane, the garden where Jesus is praying. Uh, remember that famous prayer, not my will, but yours be done. Do you know, do you know what that name Gethsemane means? The, the name Gethsemane, it, it speaks to the process of crushing to make oil. We go to Jesus to find oil. I want to talk to you about one tool if you if you listening today and you're saying, man, that's that's me. If I'm honest, my my lamp has been empty for a while. I've been I've been running on E for quite a while, but I need more oil. Let me give you just one tool, one way to refill your lamp. I want to talk about adoration. I want to talk about adoration specifically. This this is a type of prayer. I'm talking about your prayer life. You see, we typically think of prayer, when we think of prayer, we think about coming to God with our requests. Lord, would you heal my neighbor? Lord, would you help me in this job interview? Lord, would you bless my family? Lord, would you guide me and speak to me? But, but I want to challenge you with a new way of praying called adoration. Did you know that Prayer existed before problems existed. (laughs) Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden before sin, before sickness, death. But there was prayer. God would come and walk with them in the cool of the evening, and they talked with God. They had a prayer life before there were problems. So that means the main purpose of prayer isn't just to come to God with all our problems. It's adoration. The Book of Common Prayer defines adoration this way. It's the lifting up of the heart and mind to God, asking nothing but to enjoy God's presence. 
It's the lifting up of my heart and my mind, the lifting up of my soul to God. And I'm not making a request. I'm just saying, Jesus, I'm here to enjoy you. I'm here to adore you. Enjoying God is the key to producing lasting fruit in our lives. And River City, I'm, I'm sure you're doing your best to follow God, to obey God, to serve God. But I have a question. Are you enjoying God? You fear him, but do you still love him? Are all of your prayers about needs? Do you ever just sit and soak in the presence of the lover of your soul? There's a, there's a painting that hangs in a museum in London. And the artist that painted this painting is a very, very famous art, artist from the 16th century. And, but for years... Art critics had just, they decided this was not one of his best paintings. Uh, the, the mountain in the background is kind of weird. It looks like it's going to almost fall out of the painting. Everything's kind of out of perspective and wonky. It's, it's just a strange painting. And so they all just decided he, he must have been having a bad day when he painted this painting. But one day, a renowned art critic came to observe the painting. He's standing in front of this painting and he's, he's trying to figure out what on earth was this artist thinking when he painted this painting. And then he had a revelation. This painting wasn't designed to hang in an art gallery. It was actually painted as an altarpiece. So reluctantly, this art critic, he looks around to make sure nobody's watching. And then he does something strange. Right in front of the painting, he gets down on his knees and he looks up at the painting. And all of a sudden, everything became clear. Everything came into perspective. All the angles were right. All, everything looked beautiful and perfect. It was a work of art. He just needed to get on his knees knees. I believe this is a word from God for some of you in this season. You're looking at the season of life you're in. You're standing there like this art critic, trying to figure out what is going on inside of me. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I thinking this, these thoughts? Why am I struggling this way? And, and you're looking at your life like that painting on the wall. You're looking at your own soul and it just doesn't make sense. I want to tell you today that something magical happens when you get down on your knees and simply adore Jesus. All of a sudden, life comes into focus. Everything comes into proper perspective when you just enjoy Jesus. Jesus said to one of his dearest friends one time, he said, Martha, Martha, your heart is troubled about many things. Maybe your heart is troubled about many things. You remember that story with Mary and Martha where Jesus said this. You remember Martha is upset that her sister Mary isn't helping her in the kitchen. And so she tells Jesus, hey, would you tell my sister to get up and help me? Mary was on her knees at the feet of Jesus. And he says, no way, Martha. This is where you are meant to live, kneeling at the feet of the lover of your soul. You're troubled about many things. You think you can fix them, but you need to just drop to your knees and adore me. River City, I'm here to tell you that the oil your soul is craving is found at the feet of Jesus. So I'm going to close with a simple challenge. 
I want to challenge you this week to spend some time with Jesus. Hopefully you do that regularly. Hopefully daily you're connecting with Jesus. But maybe, uh, maybe this will be different for you. I want you to connect with him in a way maybe you haven't before. I want you to come to Jesus and I don't want you to ask him for anything. I don't want you to come with needs. I don't want you to come with prayer requests. I want you to come. Let's spend 20, 30 minutes this week just enjoying Jesus. Maybe, maybe put on one of your favorite worship songs and, and sit back in the Lazy Boy and just close your eyes and just keep your mouth shut and just soak in the presence of Jesus. See what happens to your soul when you can make adoration a regular part of your life. All right, let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, I don't know the condition of every soul listening today, but you do. And Lord, I pray for those who are hearing this message, who, uh, if they would decide to be rather than seem, if they would be vulnerable, they would say, I've been trimming the wick on an empty lamp. I need oil. Jesus, I pray right here and right now, would you meet your people in this place in this wilderness season, in the dark night of the soul, I pray that you would meet them with oil, fresh oil for their soul. And Lord, I pray, like it says in the Song of Songs, that they would be the ones coming up from the wilderness, leaning on their beloved. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did, the crushing you went through, to produce oil for our souls. We thank you for that free gift and we adore you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for your presence that is always near. Even when we don't feel it, you're near. Thank you, Jesus. Meet your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. We are grateful for the Word of God and thrilled that you joined us today. We hope you experience God's presence and will continue to experience Him throughout this week. If this is your first time checking out RCC Online, please text RCC New to 97000. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus and want to know more about walking with Him, please text RCC Life to 97000. You can also stick around and chat with your online host. Have a great week.